Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, John and other organizers for this uh, opportunity to share with you some of our recent work. It's actually part of our recent effort uh, with many ionics, so I'll give a brief introduction. Uh, there are actually quite a few uh, experts here. Uh, then I'll mostly focus on efforts uh, using chemisorption approach to induce DMI and chirality switching. Uh, and I also discuss some recent effort uh, showing the uh, palladium capping layer induced effects. And then if there's time, I'll briefly touch upon some potentials for 3D information storage. And uh, for this expert audience, I don't have to spend much time. There's been so much effort trying to use the electric field to control mechanism in order to address, among other things, the energy challenge in nanoelectronics. And typically, the electronic effects are most dominant. Uh, the ionic effect has uh, been uh, highlighted particularly over the past couple of decades uh, in memristors, uh, where the electrical resistance depends on the prior history. And this may be because of conducting filament formation and breaking or ion or vacancy migration. And interestingly, if you design the system right, you can have uh, ultra fast switching uh, below nanosecond. And there's already been uh, interesting applications in artificial neural networks. The magnetic version can be uh, traced to the seminal work by Dominic Javot's group that uses electrolyte to uh, gate. Uh, under this electric field, there's charge accumulation on the exterior surface of the material, which induces uh, uh, electrostatically another layer of the opposite charge. So you have this electric double layer near the surface. And this modifies the carrier concentration and the material properties, such as anisotropy. And there has been a number of uh, excellent uh, review articles here. Um, so what we have been mostly interested in recently is the solid state version of this magneto ionics, which in essence is really atomic scale control of the interfaces. And this can happen either electrostatically, uh, which is limited to the interface, or electrochemically, where you transform the interface into some, oops, I press something wrong. Start this. Um, yeah, thank you. And with the uh, electrochemical means, uh, you can change or transform the interface into something completely different. And this has uh, led to many exciting results. Uh, for example, in this uh, seminal work uh, from Jeff Beach's group and uh, uh, also Wigan Wang's group, uh, that they show the uh, perpendicular anisotropy at this uh, cobalt galenium mosaic interface can be toggled. Uh, and this is consistent with uh, prior studies uh, that shows the oxygen uh, content right at this interface. The cobalt oxygen bond plays a very important role to PMA. And the effect size actually can be very large, uh, which is uh, very uh, uh, useful. And then recently, uh, we've done some study looking at the interfacial electrochemical reaction where uh, using galenium iron, a ferry magnet, and the galenium is a very strong oxygen uh, absorber. Uh, it grabs oxygen away from this uh, interfacial nickel cobalt oxide layer, and it leads to a, actually a magnetic uh, metallic nickel cobalt layer, which modifies the exchange bias effect. Uh, important, this shows the fat can go well beyond the interface. And in fact, uh, since the earlier days of magnetionics, uh, there has been so much progress in the field, uh, including many efforts by experts here. Uh, there have uh, been so much uh, magnetic functionalities that have been demonstrated. Uh, in fact, in principle, you can modulate all magnetic functionalities using this handle, and you can do so energy efficiently and they are also uh, compatible for 3D uh, integration. So I will focus on our recent effort in trying to uh, use uh, this effect to explore uh, DMI, which uh, again doesn't need much introduction here. And typically the DMI is fixed once you make the material, once you design your, uh, your stack, especially for the interfacial case, uh, then this uh, 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 DMI is uh, uh, fixed, introduced into the system. Uh, and uh, some of the uh, pioneering work has been shown here by Professor Dylan Dunger's group. And what we are interested in doing is to use uh, 
in a controlled ultra high vacuum system, try to use uh, chemical absorption to explore induced VMI, which gives additional handle to introduce topology uh, into the system. The technique we use for imaging the spin texture is uh, spin polarized low energy electron microscopy, uh, which uses spin dependent electron uh, reflectivity to uh, capture the magnetic contrast. It can also image magnetization vector with a very high spatial resolution approaching 10 nanometer. And uh, some of the earlier work has been shown in this uh, prior publication. And uh, this one, in fact, shows uh, uh, our interest in exploring DMI in light element system in contrast to a conventional system that involves heavy metal because of a strong spin orbit coupling. So for our study, uh, which is led by Dr. Gong Chen, um, we first uh, came up with a, uh, a background. It's kind of like when we do X-ray diffraction, we want to use a zero plate so we know uh, clearly what the peaks are. Here we want a background that has essentially zero DMI, which is this multi-layer structure of uh, nickel cobalt, which gave us the perpendicular magnetization, and then palladium tungsten have opposite DMI. So if we design the thickness of the palladium just right, we can cancel them out, which is shown here. Uh, this is the case with the 2.1 monolayer of a palladium, and then this is the spleen image. Uh, the black area shows the magnetization coming out of the screen, gray is going into the screen, and then along the domain wall boundary, uh, the arrow shows the magnetization. And in this case, we see the magnetization are all pointing from black to gray, uh, which is illustrated here. So they form this uh, clockwise uh, right-handed chiral neo wall. If we increase the palladium thickness to 2.9 monolayer, we see the exact opposite. Now you see the magnetization is all pointing from gray to black. And this corresponds to this counterclockwise winding or left-handed chiral neo wall. And in between at 2.46 monolayer, we have this two DMI balanced. So this is our zero DMI point. So we're going to sit very close to this DMI, zero DMI point and uh, uh, we're going to sit initially on this side with a little bit of uh, uh, larger palladium thickness. And so at 2.76 monolayer, we see initially the, the contrast. This is a, a, a spleen uh, video. As we introduce oxygen, this is less than one monolayer of oxygen, we see the contrast going to change. Initially, it was white here, black on top. As we introduce oxygen, the contrast switches. And this is uh, uh, more clearly shown here. Uh, initially, we have left-handed anneal. Arrows are pointing from gray to black. And then after we introduce less than quarter monolayer of oxygen, we see this exactly switches. So the domain wall has switched from left-handed anneal to right-handed anneal. And this is a frame-by-frame -frame breakdown uh, as we increase the oxygen coverage, we see this transition. Uh, we can also uh, quantify this transition by monitoring this angle, which is uh, the angle magnetization makes with respect to domain wall normal. Uh, so uh, at low oxygen coverage, uh, we see the, a single peak uh, indicating left-handed anneal. And eventually, as we increase the oxygen coverage, we see a right-handed anneal. And in between, there is the zero DMI point. And this depends on the palladium thickness, because in this example, we start with 2.76 monolayer. If we have different palladium thickness, then it requires a different amount of oxygen coverage to trigger this transition. And from there, we can actually construct this uh, phase diagram uh, that shows um, in order to balance uh, the uh, DMI change caused by 0.37 monolayer of palladium, we need uh, about a quarter monolayer of oxygen. And from there, we can extract the DMI value, uh, which is about 0.6 uh, milli electron volt per atom for a single monolayer coverage. And this is actually quite large effect. Uh, here, for consistency, we show uh, the uh, DMI value all determined by this uh, spleen technique. And the oxygen chemisorption induced the DMI is uh, quite large. Uh, the physical mechanism here uh, is the charge uh, transfer because of the electronegativity difference between uh, oxygen and the nickel. And so the charge transfer leads to a uh, polarization and rehybridization, and it leads to an induced uh, electric surface dipole moment 
uh, this is also reflected in the electron work function measurement which we did. So with this large DMI, we're able to actually manipulate spin texture. Uh, here is a, a skirmium bubble uh, initially, uh, sorry, uh, on top of uh, a 2.6 monolayer of a palladium. As we introduce oxygen, uh, it goes from initially left-handed to a chiral and then e eventually right-handed uh, skirmia. And this is all done just at room temperature with oxygen. Uh, in this particular system, there's a little bit of a weak residual uniaxial anisotropy. So we've also uh, looked at another system without a palladium getting rid of this anisotropy and we see this uh, 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 transition from chiral neo to chiral block. Uh, so this indicates the chemisorption induced effect is actually quite uh, useful to uh, allow us to manipulate the spin texture. And then a uh, more recent study is that we go to the lightest element, hydrogen. Uh, in this case, uh, we s again use the same platform of a nickel cobalt palladium tungsten. We sit very close to the zero DMI point. Uh, as we introduce uh, hydrogen, we uh, again can induce this uh, chirality transition from left-handed nil to right-handed nil. Uh, and this video would show this uh, uh, switching from black to white contrast, indicating this chirality switching. Um, and we were able to uh, trace this together with the electron work function change, which tells us the coverage of uh, hydrogen on top of this uh, uh, multilayer surface. And then we did a multiple cycles. We introduced hydrogen, then pump it away, introduce, pump it away, and this is uh, largely reversible. Um, so this is uh, actually quite relevant to, uh, for example, solid state ionic uh, devices uh, where uh, you can introduce uh, oxygen or hydrogen to the all important interface into contact with the ferromagnet, and then you let this uh, DMI handle to uh, tailored uh, spin texture, and which I'll give uh, some other examples later. So th those two pre uh, previous examples are all sitting near the zero DMI tipping point. So as we uh, use chemisorption to induce DMI, we're able to switch to the other side. Now, uh, this example, uh, we go to another tipping point. So this time, we uh, still use the same stack, but now the palladium thickness is much larger. It's a four monolayer. So we're far away from the zero DMI point. We're at another transition point, which is the spin reorientation transition. And by choosing the nickel thickness just right, uh, as we introduce hydrogen, we can go from perpendicular to in-plane. So you see this uh, video, when the contrast fade away, that's where the magnetization goes in-plane. And in fact, this is the same physics as uh, uh, Jeff Beach's group have shown uh, in their proton pump uh, experiment of uh, solid state magneto ionics, uh, except there it's everything happened under buried interfaces. And in our case, uh, we have a controlled uh, uh, platform to explore uh, this uh, chemisorption in induced effect. And uh, there has been previous uh, surface science studies uh, shows that uh, the hydrogen uh, getting into contact with the cobalt surface would induce such a, a transition. So now, uh, together with this uh, anisotropy change, we found we can actually write skirmions. Uh, so uh, in this is a region in the Ascron uh, film. As we introduce hydrogen, we observe what appear initially look like a bubble domain and, but with uh, using spleen, we can actually experimentally determine this arrows array plot, and this is actually a new skirmia. Okay, so this is all done uh, just by introducing uh, hydrogen. And this is uh, uh, an example of uh, uh, several different regions with magnetization uh, pointing up or down, and then during several cy uh, uh, cycles. So this uh, uh, video, will show as we introduce hydrogen, we'll see the skirmions nucleate, and then when we pump hydrogen away, they disappear, uh, and we can repeat this uh, multiple times. 
And so this is uh, what I mean by putting skirmions out of thin air. In this case, it's a thin hydrogen. It doesn't have anything else. And in contrast to the usual uh, experimental conditions where you will need to use a magnetic field or electric field or heat and so on. Uh, but here we, we don't have all, any of that. Uh, so uh, this is an interesting new angle. And uh, but uh, it's not surprising really because we're sitting right near the magnetization, the, the anisotropy transition point. So this effectively is uh, uh, changing the anisotropy and we've done Monte Carlo simulations to confirm this. It's e e effectively like you're applying a magnetic field to tailor the local energy landscape and you're able to write and uh, delete magnetic skirmions. Uh, in the next part of our uh, Mention another recent study uh, we did, again led by Gong, uh, which is using palladium capping layer to uh, influence the domain wall chirality. And this is uh, uh, looking at the same multilayer stack of nickel cobalt on top of a palladium tungsten. Uh, and here the, the palladium thickness is again tuned very close to that zero DMI point. So then as we introduce a very thin layer of a palladium capping layer, uh, this is only down to about 0.22 monolayer, uh, we are able to switch the domain wall from left-handed annual to right-handed annual. Um, and then furthermore, using this, we're able to tailor the skirmium bubble uh, chirality. So this is a skirmium bubble and as we uh, increase the palladium capping layer thickness, we see the, the topological character evolve, okay? So initially, this is a left-handed skirmion. As we uh, cap it uh, with a thicker and thicker palladium uh, up to 0.22 monolayer, eventually switches to right-handed. But in between, uh, you see this evolution starts to get a little messy, particularly at 0.14, 0.16 monolayer. And if we take a walk, along this uh, 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 boundary, uh, when it is a skirmion, you finish a walk, oops, I, uh, sorry, I press the wrong button again. Um, if you could please uh, show it in slide mode again. Um, for a skirmion, if I finish walk along this uh, circumference, I'm gonna cover two pi, which will correspond to skirmion number one. And this is indeed the case for most of the coverage except the two I mentioned earlier that the, for the intermediate coverage of 0.14 and 0.16 monolayer, it go back to zero. So these two cases are topologically trivial. And this is the part we are right at the zero DMI tipping point where the topological protection breaks down. And we can look at the, um, the DMI energy cost on both sides. Uh, which is uh, actually very small. This uh, for the size of our skirmion, which is about a micron or so, uh, this energy cost come down to less than one atom joule, uh, which is promising because this corresponds to the minimum energy we have to pay uh, in order to switch it. But once you switch it, you can uh, increase the thermal stability, kind of a borrowed idea of a hammer, heat assisted manual recording, for example. So. Uh, you can just tune very close to that switching point, spend little energy, switch the chirality, and then later on you can use other uh, stimulus to boost up that thermal stability. Okay, so in the last bit, uh, I want to mention uh, some potential uh, applications uh, as this uh, figure has been shown multiple times. Uh, one of the uh, envisioned application is uh, using chiral domain walls or skirmions for 3D racetrack memory. And in fact, uh, Parkins Group just recently had another nature nanotechnology paper uh, experimentally realizing such a thing. Uh, very exciting. Um, one of the challenge is of course, when you have such a complex uh, 3D system, and it, was, it will be almost impossible to try to electrically uh, control each individual spin texture. So this is where the chemist software angle could come very handy because that in principle offers a contactless way to allow us to switch the chirality. As we have already shown, uh, we can switch the domain wall chirality with hydrogen chemist option. And as you do so, uh, uh, you can influence the motion of uh, such a chiral spin textures. 
And in our control experiment, the, uh, the chemisorption happens under UHV, but this can be readily integrated into solid state devices. For example, you can uh, use uh, uh, external stimulus such as the electric field to drive the ions in a ionic reservoir layer, drive it into contact with a, a ferromagnetic layer, and then at this interface, you can let uh, this chemisorption to play its trick to, to influence DMI, to influence uh, anisotropy, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we are pretty uh, excited that this potentially can be uh, integrated in the solid state devices. And in that end, uh, we've started some uh, exploration of some prototype 3D uh, structures, try to see if uh, eventually we can get there, but this is still just the beginning. And one of our recent effort is to construct interconnected 3D magnetic nanowire networks. And the nanowire networks were uh, built by using multiple angle ion tracking. Uh, so we use a, a radioactive source and uh, the decay fragments go through a uh, polycarbonate membrane and we do the ion tracking at multiple angles. And afterwards we etch out the damaged tracks. We use electrode deposition to fill up the pores. So we end up with this uh, uh, interconnected self-supporting network. And we've made a, a number of uh, different uh, types and I will uh, focus on uh, one type that's made up of a magnetic cobalt uh, where we track the, the membrane at three angles. So one normal and then two at uh, 45 degree at the zero and 180 as a mutual angle. Uh, so in order to study the magnetic behavior of a such network, which is very complicated, uh, we used something called a fork, first order reversal curve method. And uh, this may or may not be familiar to the audience. I'll just mention very briefly. Uh, so instead of uh, measuring a conventional single major loop, uh, this fork method measure many, many partial hysteresis uh, curves. Uh, we call first order reversal curve or fork. And then afterwards, we do a second order derivative of the magnetization with respect to reversal field and applied field. And in essence, we are basically disturbing the system to see how it will respond. Uh, we can uh, get a distribution of this uh, uh, fork distribution, which illustrate uh, the, the variations of the magnetic properties in the system. Uh, so in simple cases, if everything is identical, let's say a collection of identical magnetic nanoparticles, you're gonna see a delta function. And if you have a coercivity distribution but now interacting, you see a horizontal ridge. If you have zero coercivity distribution but uh, finite uh, interaction, you will see a vertical ridge. Uh, if you have a both of this, then you will see a uh, wishbone structure. And this were all experimentally observed in various systems. And so in our nanowire network, we see a lot of uh, rich features. By the way, this is a, a mini fork library we built uh, on our group website, which contains various, uh, actually many, many systems uh, addressing the different features of the fork technique. So using this, we were able to capture the magnetic fingerprints of the uh, nanowire networks. Uh, this is uh, the simplest case where the nanowires are not intersecting. These are just uh, a single angle tracked parallel cobalt nanowire array. And we see features, for example, this vertical ridge uh, come from demagnetizing dipolar interaction because the adjacent wires want to be anti-parallel. Um, and then when we vary the angle, uh, we see uh, eventually, for example, in this case, the magnetic field is perpendicular to all of the nanowires we see a reversible ridge. Then when we go to the uh, intersecting nanowire network, we see something similar but different. So in this case, uh, this vertical ridge is still there, but now it's tilted, and then we see this wishbone structure. And this is because of this uh, intersections, and it suppresses the demagnetizing dipolar interaction. And eventually, this case is where the dipolar interaction is minimal. Uh, so I won't go into details, but just to show you this qualitative difference. Uh, and in the end, we were, we captured uh, this uh, fingerprints at all these different geometries. Uh, one of the uh, interesting potential is that we can uh, set the magnetic state of a such a network in a particular configuration. Uh, 
and then we can uh, use, say, magnetic field or current to drive that magnetic state to propagate from one region to another, uh, which will be very interesting for potential 3D information storage. And to that end, we've done some initial study. Uh, we've measured uh, magnetic resistance in such a uh, network, and we did a magnetic resistance fork. Uh, basically, the way it's done is uh, uh, we bring the network to saturation, we measure the mental resistance to a particular reversal field, and we go back up, and then go to more negative field. So we see very interesting switching behavior. Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, hysteretic behavior. Certain jumps only happen after we apply the field beyond some other jumps. So basically, only certain segment of the nanowire network has switched, then it leads to a subsequent switching event. There's also some stochasticity. Uh, even though we start at the same field, sometimes it choose a different path to switch back and forth. Uh, so these are uh, some potentials to implement uh, multi-state memristors. So with that, let me summarize. Uh, we've shown uh, a number of uh, magnetoionic uh, functionalities, particularly by controlling DMI and magnetic anisotropy. Uh, which allow us to manipulate uh, skirmions and chiral domain walls. And then there are some potentials for 3D uh, magnetic nanowire networks. Then finally, uh, the people who really did the work, uh, much of the work I discussed were led by uh, Gong Chen, along with uh, Chutaman Bhattacharya and my other student, my colleague Gen Ying at Georgetown, uh, former student Peter Mary and Mac Roberts, current student Mac Robertson, still at UC Davis. Uh, my great collaborators, Andrea Schmidt's group at LBL, uh, Professor Roland Wiesendanger's group at Hamburg, Stefan Bluger's group at Ulich, who did the DFT calculations, uh, Alex Groot, uh, Julie Borcher's group at NIST for neutron study, Xixiang Zhang's group at KAUST for imaging, along with other colleagues at the Complutense, Autonoma University of Madrid, Nanjing, and uh, Guangxi University. Uh, with that, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Um, oxygen or hydrogen to the material and then you change the temperature. Does this affect the material properties so your skirmions go away or domain ones? Uh, we did a temperature dependent study on the hydrogen one. At a higher temperature, it, it's faster for the hydrogen to desorb. So that affects the kinetics of that absorption desorption part. Uh, the oxygen one, I don't think we've uh, done the temperature variation. But temperature certainly plays a role in this particular experimental setting. Thank you. <coughs> and I have another question. Yes. So did you also study then the dynamics? Because when you start switching the chirality, maybe in the meantime you go from near to Bloch-like, and then sometimes the dynamics are dependent on the helicity? That's a great question. We have we, That's something we want to do. We have done very limited uh, studies so far. Uh, we were trying to like resolve the First of all, the speed limit of the switching, and that's the thing we've been working on. So for example, the writing part of the skirmion, the time resolution is below the experimental Ooh, limit. It's below 250 milliseconds. The desorption takes a few minutes because we're just pumping it away out of the UHV system. Uh, we want to do more as you're suggesting, and I hope to maybe report back later when we have more results. Thank that's you. Great question. Thank Very nice uh, work, thank you. Thank you. Just a small question about this uh, palladium capping results where you yes. change the, 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 the between left-handed and right-handed chirality. Yes. Is it pure uh, right-handed chirality or you still have uh, block uh, points or something? Because I, I don't understand the color code there. there. Oh, okay, yeah. So by the time we get to uh, 0.22 monitor, it's pure right-handed. It's at the intermediate state where we have a mixture. Oops. Uh, I have a one chart. This one. OK. So um, this earlier ones, these are all uh, pure. This one, we, we really have a mixture. Yeah, you, you see this uh, going 
you could begin to have block uh, components. And this is where it breaks down, this, this two particularly. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so some of this, it begins to develop some block component there, but it recovers. So if you follow this uh, walk, it, it, it goes back to this uh, two pi, but it's this intermediate stage that's the worst. Thank you for the very nice presentation. So Thank I have two you. short questions. Yes. First of all, so for the writing and the deleting of the skirmions, Yes. so you showed us this nice movie. So when you introduce the hydrogen gas, then you can write them, right? You Sorry. can write them, yep. and then when you take as a, when there is no gas there, then you they disappear. Yes. But uh, can you then just write them so they also stay there? Is there a way to manipulate in such a way that you can, or do you have to just keep on the gas? Or yeah, in this case, uh, yes, you sort of have to keep the hydrogen there to maintain the skirmia. Mm -hmm. Once we pump it away, it goes away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But to answer your question. If I would think of a, a potential device in the future, maybe that's that's where I will nucleate skirmia first, and then I will use some other stimulus, uh, mm -hmm. use temperature, magnetic field, whatever, to keep it. Mm -hmm. Then I can remove the hydrogen will still be there, hopefully. Okay, so thank you. And the second question uh, regarding the 3D nanostructures. So uh, can you then basically then fabricate uh, arbitrary shapes, or does it have to, behave like, I don't know, do you have some constraints? For, for or this can type you also, like, so you have like stacked layers, you know, it's not only like one type or stuff yeah, like that? Yeah, uh, that's uh, very difficult. That's, I think, in I know, that's what I'm asking. For, for all this uh, 3D nanostructure. Uh, this is uh, basically allowed by our experimental setup, so we made it such an interconnecting network. We can make some variations of it. We've made actually random networks of uh, nanowires. But to have older the structure <coughs> they have stacked up, that's very difficult. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I just have to ask two. Uh, the first one. What is the mechanism by which if you can absorb uh, hydrogen, you decrease the PMA? Oh the, oh, the PMA. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, there was a study by Andrea Schmidt and the uh, uh, co-workers in that, uh, I think it was a PRB paper. Uh, the electronic structure modified, so th there was a sign change uh, for the anisotropy. I well, because I it seems a huge effect, uh, just if it's just electronics. But uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, let me point out. Let me see. Yeah. It's, it's okay. Yeah. So, so for example, uh, this uh, PRB discussed. Uh, they, they really looked into the electronic structure when you have hydrogen on top of a cobalt, and then there was a sign change that made the PMA want to go. So just a little bit effect, okay. But I don't know what but is the change of the M of uh, PMA. I mean, the actual quantitative change of uh, PMA. You are close to the reorientation transition. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. I think there, this paper, they 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 have some figures showing the the uh, redistributed uh, wave function, uh, and there was uh, uh, I, I remember the sign change. And the second question is sort of a textbook question. <laughs> because, okay, from textbook we learned that uh, PM, uh, DMI is supposed to be an interfacial effect. And then you show that, in fact, uh, by uh, changing the thickness of the palladium, so you manage to counteract the, PM, the, P, the DMI that comes from the bottom. So it means that it's not an interface effect. So how do you comment on this? Oh, that's a great question. I think there, there, there are <laughs> both. Uh, uh, Maybe we need a series to answer this, but we definitely see the effect from both interface and the bulk. Uh, I s in certain system, maybe it's more sensitive at the interface. In others, definitely the bulk also plays a role. So, so I yeah, I, 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 I Yeah, we, we, 
we, in fact, have done studies by tuning the layer of thickness. We can definitely tune. Yeah, no, 